was General George Washington, one of the great military leaders of all time. He was also a devoted husband and humble man. Author Stanley Weintraub's most recent book captures the intimate story of a weary George Washington following the Revolutionary War and his four-week journey back to his wife Martha and Mount Vernon home in time for Christmas. Let's take note with Stanley Weintraub, Evan Pugh Professor Emeritus of Arts and Humanities at Penn State and author of numerous histories and biographies. His most recent is General George Washington's Christmas Farewell, published by the Free Press, a division of Simon & Schuster. Thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be here again. This is actually your second Christmas story. Uh, your last one was about the Christmas Day truce in 1914 when uh, Allied and German soldiers called a truce uh, on Christmas Day. Refused to fight each other. What, what was so remarkable about George Washington's 1783 Christmas that inspired you to write a book about it? Uh, I was planning to write a book about how the uh, revolution was perceived from England uh, called Losing America. And I'm still planning on completing Losing America, but this was to be the end of the book, the end of the war, Washington returning home. And as I researched this, I realized uh, that this was a book all by itself, uh, that Washington uh, began a journey home that was to change America completely uh, from a military to a civilian republic, uh, and that uh, Washington would be considered one of the great men of the world for having relinquished power. And now George Washington's uh, Christmas farewell when he resigned from, from head of the army is really his only farewell. Many people think that there was also a farewell uh, after his two years in office as president. His two terms as, two pre terms, his two terms as president uh, concluded uh, with a, an address that he had published in a newspaper. Uh, it was not anything he actually uttered. The only farewell address that he actually gave before an audience, and possibly the greatest speech uh, ever given by an American president, uh, was his resignation as Commander-in-Chief of the Army in December uh, 1783 at Annapolis to the Continental Congress. And that was only two days before Christmas. And now, he, he movingly bade farewell to his officers and uh, troops in uh, France's tavern in, in New York. How difficult was it for him to say goodbye? We have to remember that the war began in 1775. Uh, Lexington and Concord was April 1775. We're now in December 1783. Eight years have passed. He has been at war for eight years. He only visited Mount Vernon once in the whole eight years of the war. Uh, his men were tired. Uh, he was tired. Uh, they were grateful that the war had finally ended. Uh, they knew they would, might never even see each other again because this, after all, was a huge country, 1,600 miles long from Massachusetts to uh, the end of Georgia. Uh, this would never happen again. At least they hoped it would never happen again. So these were men who had been part of his life for eight years. You write, he didn't prepare a formal address because, quote, perhaps he could not trust his emotions to read one. We're talking about a very emotional uh, farewell on, on both sides. Uh, he entered New York in a deal with the British uh, that the British would leave as soon as he took control. The British had no idea he had so few soldiers left. He couldn't pay them. There, they, they, there wasn't any money uh, offered by Congress. He had only 800 soldiers left. The uh, general who led his army into New York, General Jackson, had to take a cut in rank to colonel because you couldn't be a general in charge of only 800 soldiers. So Washington's forces were very limited uh, and uh, not, not a group that could really uh, fight out a war in New York. Uh, but they didn't have to. It was being relinquished to them. Uh, they traveled southward uh, from uh, upper New York, from Westchester County, uh, down to the Battery. Washington was planning to take a barge across the Battery uh, to New Jersey and then head home at the end of this. Uh, on December 4th, uh, 1783, uh, he met his troops, the officers, for the last time. Uh, in Prince's Tavern, he had arranged for this. He had paid for a buffet of cold meat and wine uh, to serve to them. They gathered about. None of them were eager uh, to drink the wine, to, to eat the buffet that was prepared. Uh, Washington broke down as he spoke to them. Uh, he finally uh, said to them uh, that he can't possibly greet each of them individually. Would they come up one by one so he could shake them by the hand? Uh, 
and say his farewell. And they wept. Washington wept. It was a time uh, when it was not ungentlemanly uh, to uh, show your emotions. And on the cover of the book, you see the, uh, an artist's rendition of Washington embracing one of his generals. You mentioned that there was no pay for the soldiers, and in fact, General Washington was offered what would have been $500 a month and refused it. In fact, he didn't draw a salary throughout his command. Washington didn't want to make it seem as if his ambitions to be commander-in-chief of the army had any kind of monetary uh, value. Uh, he was doing this out of patriotism. He was doing this for the country. He said he only wanted his expenses paid. And uh, he would relinquish the commander job as soon as the war was over. Uh, nobody thought that this was really going to happen. Uh, after all, you don't relinquish power. At least at that time, one didn't. And when the uh, Pennsylvania painter, Benjamin West, who was the uh, historical painter for George III, uh, told the king that Washington planned to go back to becoming a farmer in Virginia, uh, the king scoffed. He said, uh, nobody does that. If Washington does that, he'll be the greatest man in the world. And in fact, uh, King George III said he was the greatest character of our age. And also it was said that if, if he had remained in charge of the army, that he would have virtually been a king. Uh, he could have been king had he wanted to be. Uh, that wasn't what he was fighting for. Uh, when he became commander in chief of the army and was uh, jumped up uh, four ranks uh, from the colonelcy that he held in the French and Indian War with the British, uh, it was because he was the senior American man with uh, combat experience. Nobody else had any. And he had to create an army from nothing. Uh, he had to begin to lead an army from nothing. Uh, he suffered defeat after defeat. And yet he held the army together. And the important thing in the eight years of the war uh, was that he kept the army together. He kept an entity. Uh, he kept a, a, a force uh, that continued to evade the British until the British were exhausted. Why was it so important for him to be home in time for Christmas? Christmas was more important in Virginia than it was in other parts of the then 13 colonies. It's very strange to consider how different Christmas was then. Uh, Washington had been married on Twelfth Night. He knew something about uh, Christmas, Christmas. Eve. Uh, and he was hoping to get home by Christmas Eve. Uh, if one lived in the state of Massachusetts at that time, a very glum, state from the standpoint of religious observance, uh, you would have been fined six shillings for celebrating Christmas, for having any festive Christmas. Uh, even as uh, far south as Philadelphia, there wasn't much in the way of celebration of Christmas. By the time you got farther south, places like Virginia, uh, it was a happy time. Uh, it was festive. Uh, they had fox hunts. They shot guns in the air. Uh, they drank a great deal. They danced reels. Uh, but not many of them went to church. Uh, it was not a religious holiday. Uh, there were no Christmas trees yet. Nobody had uh, invented the Christmas tree. Uh, the Victorian Christmas, as we think of it now, uh, didn't exist. Uh, there was no Santa Claus. Although General Washington was stopping to buy yeah. presents for his wife, Martha. But there were traditions of buying presents, yes. Uh, buying presents for kids uh, because there was St. Nicholas Day on the 6th of December. Uh, and that was a day when one distributed presents to children. And gradually, St. Nicholas Day uh, got conflated with uh, Christmas Day. And so Christmas became a, a gift-giving day. And the British also had a tradition of Boxing Day. Uh, Boxing Day uh, was the day when you gave a Christmas box to your servants. That was the day after Christmas. Uh, since they had to work through Christmas, you gave them a few coins the next day, and that was their Christmas box. So we have, it was a very different Christmas than we have now. Now, of course, George Washington hadn't seen much of his wife in, in his married life, and in fact, missions had taken him away from his wife at least half of their, their married life. Uh, he did get to see her because she traveled to, to visit him uh, off and on during the Revolution. And curiously enough, that expense account that Washington kept included reimbursement for Martha Washington's trips to see him. I don't know if uh, uh, officers could get away with anything like that today, uh, but they were willing to grant him anything. Uh, finally, though, in mid-October, uh, when they were near Princeton, uh, he told his wife it was time to go home. Uh, the snows were bound to come soon. She might never make it home for Christmas, and he hoped to see her there at Christmas. And he had every intention of getting home 
Uh, but on December 4th, he was at Francis Tavern saying goodbye, and he had no idea how long it would take him to get to Virginia. Uh, after all, it was horse and wagon, horse, barge. Uh, weather. Weather. There were all kinds of uh, things that could happen to make it impossible, but he made it. Now, you, you describe him in your book as a humble man and a loyal patriot with a deep commitment to his family. What does that four-week journey uh, that George Washington uh, took add to our understanding of who George Washington the man was? Uh, Washington was being called by uh, the press uh, and in fact around the world because of his desire to go home and be a civilian, to be a gentleman farmer again at Mount Vernon, uh, the new Cincinnatus. Uh, Cincinnatus had been a Roman consul uh, who had been dictator of Rome and then uh, resigned in order to go back to his farm. But uh, Rome needed him and called him back several times. Uh, Washington didn't want to be called back, uh, yet he discovered on his trip home the adulation everywhere he went, the uh, disunity he saw everywhere he went, that he was still needed. Uh, he had begun to write a speech to the Congress uh, in which he would uh, indicate uh, that he was finished with public service. He was 52. Uh, that was, again, getting old for his time. And he wanted to uh, go back to being a civilian. Uh, but when he got to Annapolis, he began to correct his draft. And I noted in the book uh, that he had said uh, he was offering an affectionate and final farewell to the Congress, and that he was taking ultimate leave of public service. He crossed those lines out. He understood that he might be needed again, just as Cincinnati was needed again. And as people saw him in the flesh uh, on his trip back through New Jersey, through Philadelphia, through Wilmington, uh, and into Maryland, uh, he was a godlike figure to them. Uh, he was six foot four. The average American male was five foot six or five foot seven at best. He literally was godlike to them in every way, in dignity, uh, in manner, uh, and in size. With just a couple of seconds remaining, what ultimately did George Washington leave to us in terms of American democratic leadership? Uh, he left us a civilian society. He left, uh, he left us a society in which the military takes its orders from civilians. And on that note, we're out of time. Thank you so much for being with us. We've been talking with Stanley Weintraub, who is author of General Washington's Christmas Farewell, published by the Free Press. For Take Note, I'm Patty Satalia. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.